Good morning, everyone. I would like to extend a warm welcome to everybody here on the panel, but also in the audience, to this panel on the German gamble. Uh, to quickly jump into the topic, um, one or the other of you might have attended uh, the, the talks that uh, the European leaders gave this week at this World Economic Forum, like Theresa May yesterday, like uh, Emmanuel Macron and uh, Angela Merkel on Wednesday. And one might get the impression that a little shift is happening regarding the German leadership in Europe and the situation of Germany as a strong um, country in the European uh, settings. So um, when I remember, it was about uh, last uh, autumn uh, before the federal elections that uh, the Financial Times wrote, Germany has turned from the sick man of Europe to the engine of growth. That this uh, is still true in a way because um, the outlook is very promising, a solid growth rate of 2.3% in 2017 and the lowest unemployment rate since the German reunification shows that uh, Germany is on track business-wise, economic-wise. On the other hand, we have a recent spoiler in the situation, and that is politics. Because it's been more than half a year that uh, Angela Merkel is struggling to form a government, and it's still not clear whether there will be one soon, which would be around Eastern, or we will be eventually heading um, uh, towards a new round of elections. This is um, a certain situation we haven't known up to now in Germany and it seems to somehow paralyze the country. And in this session we want to discuss how the development of forming a new government or not forming a new government in Berlin will impact not only the German situation but also European economics and European politics. Who will be the winner and who will be the loser of this game and this gamble? Our panelists in alphabetical order today, this morning, are Jacqueline Hunt. She's a member of the board of management uh, of uh, the Allianz Group uh, in Germany. Um, we have Gisbert Rühl, the CEO, the chief executive officer of Klöckner in Germany. We have Jan Werner Müller, um, professor of politics at Princeton University in the US. And we, we have Francois Vira de Gaillot, the governor of the Central Bank of France. Welcome to you all. Happy to have you here on stage. Monsieur Vieux, the, the German government uh, is been, uh, or the German chancellor has been struggling to form a government since September. When Angela Merkel um, went on stage this, this Wednesday, she said she does not want to be pitied for the situation. She just wants fingers crossed. What's your feeling about Germany? You pity the German chancellor or you cross <coughs> fingers that something might happen soon? Uh, first, let me tell how delighted I am here as a non-German, as a, as a friend of Germany. I could also speak Deutsch, sprechen, wow. but that das will probably be English practical. Uh, and so I said, uh, as a French official, as a committed European, and as a friend of Germany, without any doubt, we Europeans need a strong Germany. And uh, I wouldn't pity the Chancellor. I would wish a stable government in Germany. It's obviously in German interests, but we Europeans need a stable German government. We need a strong Germany, and we need some kind also uh, of German leadership. So I wouldn't overstate this issue be, uh, uh, about who is the leader in Europe, where is the leadership in Europe, is it shifting from a country A to a country B? What is important, and this is one message here in Davos, is that it's a window of opportunity for Europe as a whole, Europe is back in some measure, but in order to consolidate that, we need a stable and, if possible, pro-European German government. Mr. Rühl, um, there are uh, debates, rumors in Germany that um, for, for uh, the business sector, it might not be that relevant whether there is a government in place or not. Would you agree to that? Uh, yeah, I would agree to a certain extent, <coughs> excuse me, um, because uh, when it's more of the same, it doesn't really matter. And so, because what we need uh, uh, from the government is uh, execution, uh, and uh, so we have a we have a lot of subjects uh, where, where um, uh, especially for instance, digitalization, uh, where execution is necessary, and where where I'm seeing really no progress so far. There are a lot of debates, there are a lot of discussions, but there is no execution. And this against the world, which is changing 
uh, faster and faster. And not only in the US, no, where we have these big tech companies, which getting now back, uh, by the way, a lot of money, 250 billion, which they can spend additionally. By, by the US tax reform. By, by the US tax reform, but also, also from China. So we have in, in the US, we have Amazon, we have Apple, we have Facebook, we have Google, but now on the other side, uh, we have uh, Alibaba, we have Tencent, and uh, we have Baidu, and, and uh, they together all, uh, they all together uh, have also, meanwhile, a market cap uh, of more than a billion. So that is, that is a market cap of the DAX 30, of the largest 30 German companies. Right? And against all this development, all this technology is coming from here. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, the clouds, are uh, all this technology is coming either from the US or from China, and we are debating, and this is what concerns me. Let's uh, just stick for a moment um, uh, what you said uh, at the beginning of your statement. You said if it's more of the same, um, it doesn't make any sense. And is, do you yeah, mean it that matter. more of the, it doesn't matter? More of the same means what we have in the draft for uh, potential next yeah. grand collision is more just more of the same. Yeah, Europe. yeah, uh, mainly I would say mainly, uh, uh, mainly uh, more of the same. And what 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 politicians also have to understand that that uh, that the subject is the comp comp the competitiveness of the country itself. It's not necessarily the companies. No? So we, uh, most of the companies are global anyhow. Uh, and most of the companies have more, uh, uh, most of their sales anyhow outside of Germany. So when, 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 when Germany uh, loses competitiveness going forward, uh, that necessarily, that it doesn't necessarily mean that the companies are losing competitiveness too. Uh, so we, because we, mm -hmm. can, uh, 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 we can set up our digital hubs in the Silicon Valley or in, in, in Israel or whatever. Uh, and, and this is what they have to understand. And when they're making no progress here concerning, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, the digital uh, administration, uh, uh, the digital uh, uh, Netscape and so on. When they're making no progress here, uh, then uh, Germany will com lose competitiveness. And not only Germany, by the way, Europe too. Uh. And it, it uh, seems to me that you're also pointing at uh, one of the issues we are already having in Germany. The Chancellor uh, said that too on Wednesday, that the country is divided. And if business uh, goes moves on in, in, on a global sphere and politics uh, doesn't come along, then, then there will be another spread. Mr. Müller, if, we, if you look at the, the economic situation in Germany, um, it's pretty promising. It's, it's really good in a way. Still, we have the, the results of the election that, uh, shows, that show that people are very insecure. They feel insecure. They feel that they need to like, uh, take another reclusive uh, point of view on their country, less Europe, less globalization. How's that? How, where does it come from? So as you remember, after the election and then the failure of the initial coalition talks, some observers went so far as to say this is the worst crisis in German politics since Weimar. Some British observers said this uh, either because of bad judgment or because of bad faith, because they wanted to distract from the disaster of Brexit. It's not that kind of crisis. Um, I think it's fair to say that the right-wing populist party, which has now made huge inroads, as we all know, would not have done so without Angela Merkel's decision in 2015 to open the borders temporarily for refugees. So this is not some inevitable development. Mm -hmm. um, I think as soon as there is a return to a situation where people feel that, okay, things are not out of control, uh, we're not vulnerable because you know, nobody's really in charge of the situation, a lot of these votes, I think, are likely to disappear. Having said that, one thing has fundamentally changed. Up until this election, there was, stru there was structurally a left-wing majority in the German Bundestag. If the Greens and the Social Democrats had decided to have a coalition with a left-wing party, they could have had, for many years, a left-wing government. This is no longer the case. Now, structurally, we have a right-wing majority. We have an openly right-wing populist party that is clearly anti-EU, that in a sense was born out of Euroscepticism, if you like. We have a liberal party that I think is flirting very much with Euroscepticism as well. and. We have Christian Democrats who are already asking the question, what is going to happen post Merkel, not just in terms of personnel, but also in terms of political ideas. Right now, as I'm sure you all know, everybody is very worried about social democracy. Who are they? Will they survive? I would be asking the question, what about Christian democracy? What are they going to stand for 
post Angela Merkel. And especially if you look at the division between Christian Democrats and the Christian Social Union in Bavaria, the latter clearly is also very fast moving very much to the right. If you invite Viktor Orban to your first meeting of the year, you're sending a very strong signal about where you want to go. So in that sense, I think one thing one should look at for the long term is whether this structural right-wing majority could have strong implications for what Germany really wants to do in Europe. And there could be a much stronger doses, not of being anti-EU, of course, but more Euroscepticism than we're used to. But can, uh, can we, please, go ahead. No. I'm not a specialist in German politics, but uh, a question about this right-wing right -wing move you, you describe. What is the role in this move, which is real, of the migrant crisis, which you mentioned, and of Euroscepticism? I think the first factor is much more important. There is some Euroscepticism, but to give you a figure which is very impressive, when you look at the support from euro citizens for our single currency, for the euro, it is in Germany the strongest with 81%. This also says something. Mm. Mrs. Hunt, mm. can we, can we um, let uh, us be uh, derailed in a way by uh, the, the developments Mr. Miller just has described, or shouldn't we still stick to, to a track of, of moving forward, of transforming Germany, of transforming, reforming the economy, opening up to new technologies, like Mr. Ruhl said? How would you, would you recommend uh, the, the next steps from a business perspective? I mean, certainly from a, a business perspective, and, and both of the other sort of panelists on, on, on my right have mentioned it, you know, I think it's important that um, stability and clarity of, of policy um, is a consequence of the discussions and wherever they may or may not lead. Um, and why that's important is because, you know, I think Germany has had this very strong growth that you alluded, alluded to, great um, underlying economic performance. A lot of that has actually been driven over the last three, four years out of um, increasing engagement from the, the workforce. You know, labour participation rates have increased an average of about 1.1%. Some of that actually driven by immigration. Um, so about three million um, net immigration into, into Germany over the last four years. Um, and that has driven a lot of the, the, the um, sort of growth that we've seen over the period. Our view is that that is sustainable. So we could see a, a strong German economy for a period of time. But actually, if you look further out, what that risks masking is actually the underlying demographic changes that are happening in Germany. And once you start hitting sort of 2020, um, there are fewer and fewer um, working age Germans um, in, in the population. And so this question about even in and of itself, if Germany were just a, a domestic economy, and I'll come back to Europe in a second, but if it were just a domestic economy, I think there are structural changes within Germany that absolutely mean we need to focus um, as policymakers um, on things like you know, ensuring that there is an encouragement and activity and execution around investment and innovation. And digital is one element of that, but there are other elements as well. You know, I think there's this whole um, transformation of, of working expectations. There's a transformation in terms of what is going to be necessary from a skills perspective. Um, and there's been a lot of rhetoric uh, about it. And, you know, Germany has a, a unique um, capability to actually address some of these issues, both given its history and its ability, its strong, you know, sort of in industrial policy in the past, and then its financing position, its, its economic position, you know, with a, um, with, with a surplus and, and the opportunity to actually put some money in and get it working. Um, the opportunity to create an easier environment for private um, institutions to invest into the German economy. And we can maybe talk a little bit about that as well. So I think, I think that in and of itself must be an objective. Um, you know, I think from the, the European Union perspective and from the markets more, more broadly, um, you know, I think, I think moving forward from this position where we've found ourselves, this feels to me like a good time. You know, Europe is now growing. Um, I think there's new leadership, there's new energy, um, and I agree that, you know, one shouldn't worry about who's the leader, and, you know, this is about collaboration, this is about um, being open and as a region effectively driving the region forward. Um, and I think that's absolutely going to be necessary when you see the degree to which um, protectionism is rising elsewhere. So I think for Germany and Europe more generally to remain competitive, um, things like, you know, looking at what's happening in terms of corporate tax rates. Not a race to the, bo not a race to the bottom, but, yeah. you know, a, a, a way but, of... But that's the question, that whether this will happen now. America, um, like, like boldly uh, lowering corporate tax, mm -hmm. France uh, lowering corporate tax, mm -hmm. Germany yeah. doesn't do anything. And I think these are the sorts of questions that, you know, irrespective of um, how the political landscape plays out, 
I think we should be asking policymakers to, to get an agreement and some action behind. And I think business then, you know, is in a position to help support and help drive and, you know, help get the right sort of outcomes. But I think we do need that, that action um, where we stand today. Both of you said that um, it's not relevant uh, who's the leader in Europe because we are, we are uh, a community, we all need to get, uh, get uh, going together. Uh, I, can, I can relate to that in a way, but still, um, if I compare what, uh, uh, what, what you just said um, and uh, what, what Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron pointed out uh, on stage at the World Economic Forum this, this week, then I think we're actually at a turning point, and that would be, would be my thesis. I hope you, you can somehow relate to that. That um, in, the, in the times of crisis, Angela Merkel did a really good job uh, to stabilize uh, Europe, uh, not uh, letting it fall apart. Now we are, we are moving into the growth uh, dimension, mm -hmm. And now you need someone who really, who's really addressing the issues like uh, lowering corporate tax, investing in, into innovation, investing into skilling um, people, especially young women, like Emmanuel Macron pointed out. So I think there is a difference who is the leader in Germany, uh, uh, in, in Europe, I'm sorry. No, may I say two things? First, I would not exaggerate the parallel between the US tax reform and the French one. Uh, and, uh, I can understand the enthusiasm short term of business for the US tax reform, but it raises many economic and social questions, let us be clear, in the long run. And we will probably see the problems later. But the most important remark is following Jacqueline that presently uh, a strong Europe needs a strong Germany. Mm. But a balanced world needs a strong Europe. And this is more, more important than ever. We have protectionist trends. You have unilateral trends starting in the US. If we want to follow the receipt of success, which is multilateral rules of the game since World War II, this is the role of Europe in this present world today. And it's why not only we French or we Europeans need a strong Germany, it's why the old world needs a strong Europe on the world stage to say this are the multilateral rule of the game. And on this conviction, we, Germans and French, completely agree. This is one of the most important messages of today. It's why we need to act together. Because if not, mm -hmm. the unilateral or protectionist trend are at risk of winning, let's say, is the thing. It's what President Macron said when he says that globalization is at crisis at present. We need to reinform our multilateral convictions. This is the role of Europe. I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think in an environment where multilateralism has fallen out of favor and has lost the US seemingly as its main proponent, um, the question becomes who steps into that um, sort of role. Um, and if you believe, as I do, absolutely, that multilateralism has brought a period of, you know, un unexperienced sort of growth and peace and prosperity on a global basis um, post-World War II, you know, why, why would we not seek to have a strong voice to effectively mm. push that forward. Um, and it seems that that is the role of Europe because there's no, there's no other voice that can stand there. I do it, think it I want to- It could be with to... Canada and some yes. Asian countries, but Europe That's is absolutely right. necessary. Mm -hmm. I did want to pick up this point about, you know, leader or not leader. I mean, uh, taking a business analogy, the strongest teams are often the teams where you can do both, where you've got individuals who will effectively play a role. And sometimes this is personified as sort of the CEO versus the CFO type job. But actually, it's more fluid than that in, in, in good organizations. But someone who can both paint the vision and the aspiration and give the dynamism, and then someone else who can follow behind and actually make sure that it happens, that it's balanced, that you take people along with you. Um, and so I can see, depending on obviously on how it all works, I can see a very strong partnership, actually, where both parties are, are drivers um, and have sort of a co-leadership role, if you put it that way, but with very different starting positions. You know, I think um, it's great to dream, and some of the comments that we heard about, um, you know, the ultimate sort of outlook are, are very aspirational. Um, I think you need to have that aspiration to move forward. But equally, you know, we, we shouldn't be fooling ourselves. I mean, this is um, strengthening Europe has some consequences. Um, it will be difficult to take everybody alongside. And so I think having someone who follows behind and, you know, effectively talks through and brings people along and is maybe a little more pragmatic, a little more um, realistic without necessarily downplaying that dream, I, I think that could be a strong combination. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rühl, um, can, you, can you relate to uh, what Mr. Sanchez said or, or would you have wished that the 
um, the uh, vibrant talk uh, Emmanuel Macron gave uh, on Wednesday here would have been the one that uh, the German Chancellor had uh, proposed? Uh, yeah, difficult to say. No? So maybe uh, uh, the talk might have been a bit long. No? So uh, 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 Merkel was uh, was much shorter. I think only one third of the time uh, what she needed. But but uh, uh, what is uh, yeah okay? Uh, what is necessary in Germany uh, in, in Europe uh, uh, is the same than in Germany. Uh, also here, I, I'm clearly missing uh, uh, execution. Now also here we're making no progress and. And we might, uh, so I, I, I going forward, uh, the European Union for the next one and a half years might tie it up with the Brexit, for instance. Yeah? So the world is moving on and, and we have to organize uh, uh, the Brexit uh, here in uh, Europe. And also um, issues like the, the um, or subjects like the single digital market and so on. Also here we're making not any progress. And, and, and what, what, I, what I really don't understand is, so everyone knows what, what, uh, what, what they have to do, but no one is doing it. And w why uh, uh, don't we try it, for instance, in Europe, that, for instance, uh, Germany and France and maybe one other country moving ahead and try something and do something. Now, for instance, uh, uh, in, uh, only as an example, um, a, a, fund, a venture capital fund, a big venture capital fund uh, to make uh, Europe here more competitive. Now, so uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron announced that they want to release a 10 billion fund, um, I don't know, uh, immediately or uh, throughout a couple of years. But, uh, for, at for, least disruptive for disruptive innovation. For disruptive innovation. innovation yeah. and, but, but this is this is what we need. We need also we need some practical things and and also in education. We cannot wait until the education system has been reformed. When this takes five or ten years, then, then this is too late. Yeah? Let's start. Let's start small. Let's let's do a, uh, yeah like startups. Uh, uh, let's start with a minimal viable product and then. Uh, uh, we, we see how it works, and um, uh, and if we fail, we change it. But, but, but this is clearly what, what I'm missing. I'm always hearing statements, uh, but I, I'm seeing no action at all. Uh. Mr. Müller, what, what would be the, the minimal viable product for the German government uh, information? Unfortunately, it always has to be academics who spoil the wonderful sense of optimism and <laughs> cooperation and we're all moving together and so on. So I think the good news is actually that if it becomes a grand coalition, they need to have a story about why they are in government. This is a coalition that nobody really wanted. So somehow they have to tell something to people about what they really are about to do. And to say, oh, we'll just do piecemeal reform might not, be, might not work very well as but, a great narrative. But there narrative. is no story up to now. There is no but story. But there could be a story. Okay. Okay. There could, a story could be. A story could be that Angela Merkel by now clearly must have her eyes on the history books. What is she really going to leave behind? I think she will not want to go down in the history books as the person who inflicted endless pain on young Southern Europeans via austerity. So I think she is very much, in theory, interested in leaving a permanent reformed architecture of the European Union. Martin Schulz is a professional European. After the election, he said, I want the United States of Europe. Of course, the typical thing that people then say, why didn't you tell us during the election? Why, how come that politicians only afterwards come out with these you know, great ideas? But in theory, more by default than by design, they could say, this is actually our chance. Maybe it's the last time we're going to have a grand coalition for quite some time. We have people who are committed to this idea. Let's, together with Emmanuel Macron and others who want to join in, do something more permanently viable for Europe. That's the good news. I think this could really happen. The bad news is that there are still, of course, many differences. I mean, there are many things that they can agree on with Ma what Macron said at the, at the Sorbonne, but I think we should not kid ourselves. I mean, German ideas about Europe, French ideas about Europe remain somewhat different. All this in a context of a much more fragmented Europe than probably we've ever seen, and perhaps less obviously also a Europe where over the long haul now, the Commission has really been much weakened. I mean, I think we by now we've sort of almost forgotten how in the old days it was the Commission who took the lead. It wasn't national leaders who always had to agree on whether, you know, do we now be, uh, go forward as the big engine. Commission, in a sense, was setting the tone, just think back to someone like Delors. And be, partly because of the Euro crisis, the Commission has been very much sidelined. So, we should not be naive about the sort of the changed overall structural context of how European integration works. But if there is the will and the will to compromise, as always in Europe, 
I think interesting things could actually still happen in the next four years or so. And in the draft paper for, um, for the start of, of uh, uh, coalition talks, Europe is, is the beginning. It's, uh, the, I think, the, the strongest part of the whole paper. Mm -hmm. So that uh, could be one indication that you're right in, in your interpretation. I think in, on paper, it's easy to commit to this. Politically, they would really have to risk something. Because, I mean, you're absolutely right that people still like the euro, but if you look at numbers, you know, when, when Germans are asked, do you trust the ECB? It doesn't look so great. Because this narrative has taken hold that, look, the ECB is basically robbing people of their savings, you know, with these interest rates and so I, on. I will they, react. I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm, not saying this is, I'm not saying this is right. But in terms, of, in terms of, you know, if you have to tell people this is what we need to do now, this is why it has to be a great moment for European integration, I think you're going to get a little bit of resistance. So they would have to really say, look, grand coalition is something unusual, needs a special justification, and, you know, we have to convince people that even though economically things are pretty good for Germans right now, this is actually the right time to be more ambitious in terms of a European architecture. I think the case can be made. Mm -hmm. People could be persuaded. But Merkel would have to maybe overcome her, how to put this politely, aversion to sort of risking too much, leading too much from up front. Uh, from Schultz behind. would basically have to convince his party that this is also a good left-wing project and not just with all due respect about business and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not an easy proposition, but I think it could be done. You wanted to read? No. Um... I was in Maastricht 25 years ago, so I can witness one thing, that we should not idealize the good old days and think that a quarter of a century ago, it was much easier to have a French-German discussion. It was already tough, I can say you. So we have German-French debates, and we need having them, but what we can achieve is progress uh, answering probably two German worries, which I take very seriously. The first one is the one you mentioned about the risk of monetary policy being overburdened or ECB being over-responsible, so to say. It's why we need a stronger economic union, because we need other common economic tools in order for monetary policy not to be the only game in town when the next recession will come. And this is a German worry I perfectly understand. And then the second thing we could explain is going in Mr. Rule's uh, direction that it will help European competitiveness. And here you are completely right on digitalization. We could also mention energy transition, SME scaling up and such other things. We have huge investment needs in Europe. Let me offer a simple answer, at least in words, which is capital market unions. We have huge savings in Europe we have 350 billion euro each year of excess savings towards investment in Europe. We should better foster these savings towards the investment needs you mentioned. And this is private resharing, but it's about financial regulation, it's about banking union, it's about quote unquote boring topics. But these boring topics, this technical agenda, would serve the economic purpose we fully share. And if you look at the single market 30 years ago, it was also a technical agenda, but we delivered it for a very good economic purpose. We could have the same story today, and here I see no political difficulty. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's, it's a practical answer to your Europe point. spends 100 billion, is this right, in R&D, but also more in uh, common or general uh, uh, technologies and, and, and not, in, not really new technologies. When we took, uh, what took only 10%, mm -hmm. then this would be already mm -hmm. a big step forward. Probably. But yeah. we, we have the resources, we have the needs. What we need is to, it's as simple as that, to channel these private resources to the investment needs yeah. we mentioned, including research. Regarding financial policy in Europe, uh, Mrs. Sand, would you, would you think the, the ideas in Germany and in France to, to set up a joint uh, European financial um, uh, policy uh, strategy and to, to part, at least partly have a joint uh, European budget, would that help from a business perspective or what impact would that have? So I think, I mean, I would absolutely agree with the comments that you made about the CMU, the, the, the Common um, Monetary Union. Um, you know, I think moving that forward, um, Cap under capital, capital markets, markets union, sorry, um, it's moving private. that forward um, is, is an important step. You know, I think if you look at competitiveness of Europe, I think that would um, make a significant difference. I think if you look at um, is it politically toxic or not, I don't think it is. So I agree 
that absolutely the, 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 the CMU is a way you could move forward. I think this question about um, you know, the ESM and, and, and some of the backstop, again, I think while a little more difficult politically, um, I think it's achievable and it's certainly necessary in terms of the Eurozone and um, you know, actually using the good times to actually help support um, or to take the action that will be necessary actually in, in some of the more difficult times. I do think there are then a lot of other activities that could be identified um, where, where there, there is a commonness or a common um, sort of view, I think, between, between France and Germany, and in fact, some other um, European um, Union countries as well. And these are things like, you know, sort of youth unemployment and what are we doing, apprenticeship schemes, um, the retraining, um, investment into new technologies. So it seems to me that there's a range of maybe, I don't know, five or six different activities that could be undertaken that could show real progress, actually, and, and deeper integration, both um, in, the, in the actual infrastructure of the European Union and, you know, how it operates, and then also just some very practical, um, you know, sort of social good. Um, do I think that that matters from a business perspective? Yes, but I'll come back to my earlier comments, um, which is I think if Germany just waits for consensus with others, whether it's France or others, to actually act, I think then we've missed the timing. You know, I think there is this need, irrespective in terms of creating you know, a, a, an attractive business environment, um, in terms of creating the right sort of skills, competencies, cap capabilities, of, in terms of education, you know, the ease of starting up businesses in Germany. Um, and these are things that they can act on without getting agreement from, from across the political sphere. Um, and I think if you look at it from a business perspective, in the short term, those are probably the things that would make the most difference, actually, um, rather than the wider question of, um, you know, how, how do you go with the European um, project more, more, more broadly? Germany currently has an investment gap of about 130 uh, billion uh, euro, and we have, uh, unbelievably but uh, true, we have unbelievable but true, we have 30,000 industrial areas not being connected uh, to um, to uh, the the, the um, uh, fast internet. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So yeah, what, okay, what does? This is one example, no? what, what, what you were saying, so the digital infrastructure. Mm -hmm. no? So that is, that is something which, which a company has to have going forward when, when it wants to stay competitive. No? It's, and, uh, and so it's, it's, uh, and, and it's uh, not only, only broadband, it's also 5G. No? But we don't need it in every forest. No? So when you're discussing this with uh, politi politicians, then, then you often hear, OK, I most lately was in the Turing forest and uh, I couldn't uh, make a telephone. A phone call, a mobile call. So, but but at least we have the industrial centers. So they. So why don't we begin there? So we don't have to spread it throughout the country. But so this is a digital infrastructure. Is one what could Germany do on its own? No doubt about. It's and actually not just the forest. It's enough to try to ride on a train and make a telephone yeah, call, which yeah, is already yeah, very yeah, difficult right, in Germany. Also, yeah. this, this doesn't work. And. Uh, and uh, or, or, or e-government, uh, government. So it's also something what you need going forward to stay uh, uh, competitive. Now, and and this also would help my uh, maybe governance to understand how important this is and how this works. Uh, so when they do it by their own. And uh, other uh, other issues or subjects like like uh, the single uh, European digital market is of course something where you need Europe. But this is also extremely important because you have to. We, we just had the discussion uh, discussion here this morning with startups. They have problems to scale uh, because um, scaling in each country uh, in, in Europe is much more difficult than scaling to the U.S. And one guy was saying, "Okay, next time I would start in the Silicon Valley because then I immediately have a 300 billion." Uh, market no? and uh, and uh, and and uh, yeah, so they are they are, but 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 this is not new. Everyone knows it, and <laughs> it maybe a question to the to the two of you from the business side. Let us push side. capital market union together with entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, what about but what about by the way when when uh, the the German pension system uh, when out of the German pension system it would be possible for instance to spend three percent or so for new technologies? Would that be something which would work? In, in terms of, what, uh, yeah. you mean taking out of the pension system yeah. and putting in? So, so, you know, I think in terms of funding, um, if, if it was clear what was being achieved, what the desire was, I don't think there's a lack of funding. You know, I think the question as to whether it comes out of a pension system, whether it's um, private capital, whatever it might be, um, you know, I think is a secondary question in many ways. 
I think the question is the willingness to actually move it forward and to take the activity around it. And I think the funding will, will follow because, you know, in, in terms of um, if one were to look as a pure investor at an opportunity to invest in, you know, digitalizing Germany to a greater extent, all of the history would show, if you look at the Agenda 2010 sort of labor reform, you know, hugely successful. So you would have the sense of a track record, a sense of position. I mean, certainly the existing, um, you know, the existing sort of very educated, very specialized workforce would be attractive to invest into. So, so it feels to me like that's a secondary question in part. Um, but, but certainly the concept of whether it's establishing funds, um, the fund structure that Macron talked about, or you know, something else like that, um, you know, I, th I think that's the way of, of, of how do you take it forward. Is that necessary or not? Let's, let's uh, take one, one example. Um, uh, when we talk about a broadband internet, when we talk about connectivity, that's just uh, taking Germany up to a certain situation in which other countries like Estonia, uh, whatever have we, um, have arrived uh, a long time ago. So, um, but looking into the future, talking about, for example, artificial intelligence we, uh, and, and data management, we have the situation that data platform uh, platforms are huge issue. China has one, Russia has one, the US, the US uh, have uh, one, of course, Europe doesn't have one. Isn't that something where we, at the moment, lack uh, uh, leadership um, with the consequence that for the industrial internet we will experience almost the same like we did for the, for the commercial um, internet in the first uh, round? I think it's a really interesting question, that. I mean, I think if you start from the premise that actually value as we increasingly move forward lies in data and data analytics. Um, and, you know, I, th I think there's certainly indications, a lot of that sort of theme through, through the, um, the forum. If you start from that position, the question becomes, you know, who owns that, that data? Um, and I think the fact that Europe has um, really, I think, no, no internet-based companies in the top 30, you know, very little... Um, existing sort of skill and competency and, and, and capability in the sort of space um, is, is problematic or it is something we should be looking at in some form. I think there's a, a second question to it, which is, and, and, and this may be my, my personal perception, I think, I think Europeans generally feel differently about data than, say, the Americans and the Chinese do. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's almost a policy question that comes first and foremost, which is, what is it that Europe would stand for in terms of data? And I think, you know, the, so the Data Protection Act, you know, there's, there's an um, there's a individual protection about it, this belief that data belongs to the individual, that there's a right to privacy that runs through a lot of the sort of regulation on the data front in Europe. Um, and I think that would almost um, counterbalance or, or be the exact opposite, actually, of these large data platforms that are being created in the, the US or, or China. So I think the question for Europe around data is, do we believe that actually data should be um, the, the source of value in the future? Um, and, and what role do we want our individuals in our societies to play in that data? Um, and what does that then mean in terms of the existing footprint? I think absent that, what will happen is, you know, the commercial um, benefits or the state-driven benefits of data ownership will subsume Europe in, in, in its wake and we'll be playing you know, we'll be paying on the back foot all the time. And I think that's a little bit of what's happening here. There's a, an attempt to defend rather than to create a, an offensive strategy in some form. And is it a question of belief or is it a question of facts and fi figures that, that data platforms will be the future of business all over the world? Uh, yeah, I think they, they are already to a certain extent. Yeah? So all this platform, uh, this platform uh, economy is based on data. and. Uh, <laughs> And, and data is already the new oil, no? so this is already there. And uh, and uh, but but for Europe uh, concerning concerning this data platforms, it's too late uh, anyhow. No? So the big data platforms in, uh, in the US anyhow. and 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 in in, uh, in China and all what when we working on clouds also from a business perspective, typ typically these are uh, clouds uh, which are in, in uh, US clouds. No? So it's a, it's a Google cloud, it's the Amazon cloud, and and uh, it's not. It's not a European cloud. So, so this, uh, I think, uh, and, and, and also concerning IoT, Internet of Things. Okay, we in, in Germany think with Industry for Zero that, that uh, we have at least reached 
competitive position. But, uh, um, uh, but uh, the technologies uh, we use for Industry for Zero or IoT are again uh, coming mostly then from the US. Now, so it's again, it's, it's artificial intelligence, it's machine learning, clouds. And, uh, and, and this is risk, risky also going forward because of talent. Now, what will happen is also that then talent, talent goes where the technology is. And, and, uh, and, and so we might even uh, also so we, we're talking about the skills gap. Maybe we, we, we don't need this uh, to close the skills gap anymore when we're not moving forward because then uh, the talent has moved anyhow. Mm -hmm. huh? I have a well, I different. I think Whoa, <laughs> no. Uh, I think so. Sorry, I think empirically, I think you're right that it's already too late. But just to counter the, maybe the slight sense of skepticism that, oh, these anxious Europeans, they want to hold their data and they have all these irrational worries. Putting it very crudely, um, and in a cliche way you might say, might say, I mean, if you look at American political culture, mm. the leading value remains freedom and pursuit of happiness. Mm. In post-war Europe, the leading value is individual dignity. Mm -hmm. And if we remember that European integration was always primarily a political project for which the economy was a means and not an end, it also opens a possibility for European leaders to say, look, if you ask what has Europe done for you lately, a certain type of protection if people want that and democratically determine that this is what they want, is actually a positive answer to that worry. So politically, it's not all you know, bleak and, and bad because, oh, it's only obvious means that we are sort of falling behind. If people can somehow combine the right kind of economic measures with a particular, to put it very grandly, civilizational model, where individual dignity matters more, I think that's actually a positive thing and not just a negative. Mm -hmm. negative but but uh, let me let me uh, tell uh, some story here. So concerning individual data, now, so we have the European Data Protection Law, and we figured out that uh, uh, business personal data <coughs> is treated uh, like like personal data. So there is no difference. So when you uh, go on forward, when when you give someone a business card and you want to memorize this data, it falls under the pre data protection law. Mm -hmm. I went. To to Berlin, I went to Brussels. I discussed it with polit politicians on both sides. And they all agreed that this has to be changed. And, and, and then we discussed in Br Brussels how long it will take. And, it, and then they're saying we, it, it will take at least five years to change it. Huh? And then I said, OK, then forget about it. Mm -hmm. So it's, then it's too late anyway. So it's, this, even, even the small, even small changes huh, are so difficult to achieve. Take much too long. Uh, Mm -hmm. no, perhaps one word about is it too late yeah. for us Europeans. The battle of yesterday is lost, without any doubt. Mm -hmm. The battle of tomorrow is still open. And who knows which will be the technologies in 10 years. So it's still an open battle. And the role of public authorities, including at European level, is to create a, a, a favorable framework with three elements. Financing, this is a capital market union. Regulation, this is a single market, and we need a digital single market with probably a single authority, and research, talent. This is the role of public authorities, and then it's up to entrepreneurs. They will not create the European platforms or the European tech companies of tomorrow. And here, we have some motive for optimism when we look at German or French or Spanish youth. We have young entrepreneurs more than ever but it's up to us to create a favorable framework for but them. But they need money, mm. uh, so, and, mm. and they, they don't getting enough money. Uh, so they um, might, maybe, maybe when they start in the seed phase, mm. they're getting the money they need, but then when they want to scale, mm. okay, then, they, they, then they have, again, then they have, okay, uh, they, they have to again, go to the US again. This is part of the capital market yeah. union. We should create European cross-border venture capital funds, and not yeah. only seed money, but scale-up money. Mm. But, but this is, this is only uh, also up to private business. Mm. Sure, mm. but I, I'd mm. contradict one, one point that, mm. that uh, if you look at, for example, the, the Digital Resp Republic of Estonia, uh, once again, you see that uh, setting up a national blockchain, for example, mm. could be an idea. If, if Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron would step up and say, we need a European blockchain, mm. we could uh, tackle the migration issue, mm. we could tackle tax issues, you could tackle everything with that. Um, that would be really progressive. That no, would, set an, would set an example. Why, why not? But again, my only message with German entrepreneurs is to say I, I would be surprised German entrepreneurs saying the only answer lies with public authorities. For sure. This is not my vision of Soziale Marktwirtschaft. <laughs> No, no, but it's an important responsibility to create a favorable framework. 
I would like to open up um, the discussion to, uh, to the audience. Um, uh, whenever you have a question, please uh, get up. Uh, we have a microphone over there. And uh, if you would like to introduce yourself quickly, that would be great. Please, there's the first question over here. Yeah, here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Erika Kish. I teach at Princeton University. It's about the data and about the e-commerce and uh, the platforms. Uh, I think that this is the first phase of, of this economy. And uh, it, it's, these are mass products. This data is very tautological, it's algorithmic. To get ahead of it would be to do a luxury market. And since this is, by definition, a global uh, e-commerce, um, there should be the non-algorithmic processing of the data, because data is nothing, information is nothing without uh, navigation without what, what you are doing with it. And the way it is now navigated, it goes into the, the kind of business of the Coca-Cola, of like the tautological, the bubbles, the echo chamber, the, the, where there is no, in fact, uh, uh, pedagogy and heuristics and getting ahead of demand, getting ahead of, of uh, just sussing out demand and then giving the supply, but having the kind of um, uh, um, business uh, invention when you are giving, when you are uh, sussing out, um, when you are giving the supply educatively that might change and create more uh, sophisticated demands. So there are areas that I'm familiar with. Uh, I teach film and I see how Europe has destroyed the possibility of research of art films and uh, teaching of art films by the new economic laws that are done for... Turn that into a question? Yes, the question is that why is it that uh, uh, the, the, the business world is not trying to go ahead of, of, the, of the, the morally uh, already disadvantageous um, um, handling of data? and uh, rely on uh, intellectual and artistic talent and just talent in general, mm -hmm. uh, not to have the algorithmic approach to data, but a kind of a moral approach to data when it's not data anymore. Who would um, like to answer that question? <laughs> I'm not sure if I understood uh, the question correctly, but le uh, let me say it uh, in this way. So when we as a, as a corporate, uh, when we really want to do s something with data, so this will probably only successful when we when we when we are able to uh, develop new business models or even disruptive business models with uh, with data, huh? and uh, because other than that, it's more uh, an improving of the same, uh, improving uh, improving along our products, improving along our services, and uh, and and this disrupt uh, dis disruption of yourself. Uh, uh, with data, with new business models. This is something uh, where we, especially as traditional uh, corporates, uh, which, is, which is to a certain extent difficult. So we, here we have the innovator's dilemma uh, in, in principle. And, uh, but here again, this, so we, we're doing this also together. So here you need someone from outside. Here you need, again, also the, the startup community, uh, for instance to uh, develop this kind of new business models. For instance, uh, uh, when you take the automotive industry, uh, and uh, so we always coming from the automotive, and, and we still, when we uh, still uh, uh, thinking about data, then it's more the improvement of a car. Uh, but it's not a new business model for, for this uh, new mobility uh, model. And, and this is a, a, uh, the issue we, we're fighting with in, in corporates. Can I maybe add something a little, a little bit different? Again, I'm not quite sure if it's on point, but I, I want to come back to this thing about is it too late? And I fundamentally don't believe it's too late. I think what we do is we look at the Googles and the Amazons and all the rest of the world, and we think data is all about, you know, individuals, social media, um, personal preferences. And there's certainly, I mean, that's a, a big part of consumer um, products. That'll be a big part of, you know, sort of how, um, how, how new products, how new businesses are developed. There's a lot of data that isn't about that. Um, and so you look at something like um, the German healthcare system. Um, my understanding, and I'm, I'm, I'm no specialist in this area, but my understanding is because of the way the German healthcare system works, it has more deep and detailed data 
um, attributed to an individual than, than any other healthcare um, sort of environment. And so there are a lot of healthcare providers saying, is there anything that we can do on an anonymized basis? So not using individual's data, but because we then understand from this healthcare system the likely progression of diseases and the likely responsiveness to treatments. Um, if you look at other examples, um, you know, in an industry like ours, um, you know, not at the sort of the, the retail end of it, but in terms of things like, um, you know, how do you make good investment decisions? Um, a lot of investment um, decisions are driven by emotions, you know, human beings making those decisions. And sometimes emotions are good, but sometimes they're really bad. That's what triggers people always to sell into, you know, falling market and, and to buy, um, you know, at the, at the peak. So how do you effectively use data to take out the bad investment decisions? Um, and there are a million others. When you go to the Internet um, of Things, when you look at, um, you know, sort of integrated applications, uh, millions of examples where actually I think we are pretty nascent in terms of what is happening with data. Um, and where I think, you know, Europe could absolutely create, um, you know, uh, its own position, its own strategy and, uh, and work out how it drives competitiveness in an ethical and a, a moral way that, you know, people are comfortable with in terms of their data usage. There was another question over here. My name is Christian Jensen, I come from Denmark, and I would like to go back to the beginning where you talked about the future of the Great Coalition, and you mentioned, uh, Müller, that they could have a new narrative about doing uh, something with France, uh, changing Europe. Uh, there's no uh, discussion, there's more need for Europe now than ever before. There's just this problem. Uh, is the European ready for that? In 2016, we had three referendums. All of them, the government lost. Denmark, the Netherlands, Great Britain. If you look at uh, Romania, uh, Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, some of the Scandinavian countries, there's a great distrust in having more integration. So you described the projects for the coming German government, I hope there will be a coming German government, as a Euro integration project. But how would they get the European on board that? I'm glad to have the next three hours to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should get away, first of all, from a, a question that always revolves around more or less Europe. In some areas, it might be a good idea to have less Europe. In some areas, I think we've learned that even though nobody wants to describe it in those terms, we're actually seeing the emergence of what traditionally we would see as the characteristics of a state. Common currency common borders, and what we've learned is that, well, you can't really stop halfway with certain things. You might say, oh, if we could start all over again, we would have done it differently. But now, given where we are, if you want to stick with this, and since the consequences of dismantling it are pretty much unpredictable, we have to take further steps. So that's already a different framing than simply saying the old line of, oh, there always has to be more Europe because that's automatically always better. So if you give reasons and if you convince people that, look, to really kind of make something work that we've already embarked on, you need to do this, that's a different, I think, narrative than simply saying automatically always more and more and more. So in that sense, I think it's, it's not impossible to convince people. What, of course, makes it difficult is not that, you know, the European public wakes up one day and says, oh, God, Europe, we don't actually like it. It's the fact that, as you know, many national leaders have basically made it their business to say, oh, Brussels, you know, look at... With all due respect, someone like Mark Rutte, you know, who is seen as a kind of pro-European liberal leader. I mean, for years he's been saying, oh, Brussels is really terrible. And then, God forbid, yes, he has a referendum and he gets a result where it turns out the Dutch public doesn't like Europe so much. Well, God forbid, why could that be? Could that be because national leaders, in a sense, have taken the easy way route of always blaming Brussels and so on? Now, I don't want to be naive. I mean, of course, you cannot tell these people, be a better person, be more upfront and honest about how this really works. But it's also not hopeless to, I think, say, look, if we really want to make this work, we have to do certain things. The other, in a sense, issue that you pointed to, I think, is of a different nature, Hungary and Poland. This is not really about more or less Europe. I think it's sometimes represented like this by these national leaders. And they basically say, look, you know, we, we don't want more integration like this because we think the nation state should remain primary. But the real story, as you might agree, is that they have basically engaged in power grabs within their own countries. And that when people then say, oh, the populists are at the gates, but you know, thank God, unlike last year in Davos, now we've sort of kept them out. No, populists are in power in Budapest and Warsaw. And the reason they don't want more integration is that in a sense they see it as a threat to their particular kind of government 
power. So I think that requires a quite different, different response. And I will go back to the beginning and say, you know, Horst Seehofer inviting Viktor Orban to Munich and saying, Viktor Orban is a great guy for the rule of law, uh, that doesn't help either. <laughs> yeah. May I add that democracy in Europe is not only about the referenda of 2016, which you mentioned. There were very important national elections, be it in the Netherlands or in my home country, yes. which gave a strongly different signal, especially Mr. Macron won against a nationalist stance, as you know. Uh, and when you look at opinion polls since, due to Brexit probably, due to one of the referendums you mentioned, European support and Euro support increased in all the countries, in all the countries, including in Germany. It doesn't mean that Euroscepticism has disappeared. And could I say that in some measure, Euroscepticism is useful for our discussion because it says something, and here I join probably what Professor Müller said. We must be concrete in Europe. We must have a Europe of projects and not only of many f votes, talks. We probably, this is my personal view, devoted too much energy about institutions, how it works. What is more important for citizens is what it produces as concrete progresses. What we said about capital market union, what we said about a digital single market, what we could say about apprenticeship cross-border, I am an advocate personally of an Erasmus Pro program for young unqualified Europeans. This is Europe of projects. And this is for me the best answer to this Eurosceptic stimulus. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Thomas Knipp, uh, communications strategist. Great debate, uh, congratulations, but quite elitist as it should be. I would like to go back to the very beginning, uh, again, the AfD, the rise of the, 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 the populists, not only in Germany, but elsewhere in Europe too. My view is that you know a lot of these political gains uh, they got was coming from uh, regions where there is no infrastructure anymore. So people do have the very distinct feeling that the state is failing them. It's, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's, it's sort of so much about you know, the immigrants, but the immigrants might have been the, the, the rot that sort of ignited the whole thing. Um, so here's my concrete question. A, Professor Müller, do you agree that that might, be, might have been a triggering point, that people really feel that government is failing them on a very concrete day-to-day -day level? No shops anymore, no bus lines anymore, no banks anymore, and so on and so forth. And number two, um, very often I feel that um, business and politics are two parts of the, of, of the equation, that you know, the, uh, business very often acts like if there are the opposition. Uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to say, uh, come on, let's sit all down and think what we can do for business, for example, to invest in eastern Germany as one part or some rural areas where there's no, not so much infrastructure and really work it out together? Because I think the more and more populists rise, the more and more uh, maneuver room you take away from politicians to do the right thing and to, in one way or the other, by doing something or not doing something, um, you know, re react to these guys. This is, by the way, <coughs> what we've done here in, in Davos in the last couple of days. And uh, I think we also had uh, a couple of fruitful discussions, but when they decide, then they are on their own again. No? So <laughs> Maybe a quick Two answer. Points. Yeah. Two points. Are, are the voters of populist parties discontent? Yes, obviously. Are the reasons primarily economic? No. I think social science is absolutely clear on this. The economic anxiety story doesn't work. So that's why also in countries that are economically doing very well, you have very successful populist parties. Second point, is this an unstoppable development, as has sometimes been suggested? No. The single most important factor in whether these uh, parties come to power is the behavior of conservative parties. Where these conservative parties decide to collaborate with them, as in Austria, as in the UK, as in the United States, they will come to power. If conservative says no, we draw the line, they will not come to power. A very, very quick last round. Um, if you all uh, were an advisor to the German Chancellor for the coalition talks, one a specific point that you really would like to introduce to her. Mrs. Hunt, please start. The draft document was, um, was largely silent on this question of investment and innovation and you know, how do you actually drive the German economy forward, make Germany more um, attractive as a, a location to do business in. 
And I would absolutely say, you know, that can be the backbone of, of reinvigorating some of these, um, you know, less, less fortunate areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think working through, you know, what, what does that policy look like in a real way, you know, in, in, in a project-based way, whatever it might be, not just grand ideas. I would say, you know, that would give you a reason to go forward. That would be a, kind of a common thing that might Investment. pull it together. Okay, very quick. Your idea. If the German Chancellor had a French advisor, it would be a <laughs> tremendous change. Uh, but my, my only advice, uh, and perhaps to the German leaders uh, and my German friends as a whole, would be something like, don't be afraid, be more self-confident today. We need you in Europe, we need a strong Germany, and a stronger German integration, a practical, a concrete one, is in German interests. There is no contradiction on, on the contrary. Mr. Rühl. Yeah, okay, uh, practically I would say now uh, uh, it's probably difficult to change it. No? So I would say uh, if so, then, then, but then please execute. No? Execution. Execution. Is uh, interesting advice. Yeah. It feels like. Uh, no, not, not here, but, but uh, <laughs> act. <laughs> Mr. Müller, the last advice, but not least. Build up a successor who will prevent the party from lurching right. She has, unfortunately, often, if I may put it that way, executed plausible successors who look very good <laughs> in the past. Now is the time to build up some kind of statesman or, for the matter, stateswoman who can look far, who is pro-European, who can maybe join Emmanuel Macron if he stays in power for much longer to kind of drive Europe forward. Very forward-looking advice that totally relates to uh, the practical approach we, we know from business if it's run in a, in a, in a, uh, a decent way. Thank you all very much here on the panel. Thanks to the audience for listening. <laughs> Have a great day.